Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to our seventh annual LABBC Innovation Awards. My name is Dave Hodgins. I'm executive director of LABBC, and it's a fun part of my job every year to get to host this event. I always look forward to it. 2020 was an especially unusual year uh, for everybody. And I wasn't sure, honestly, uh, where we were going to end up with this event, where we're going to see a big drop off in submissions, where we're going to see our partners stay the course and power through. And I'm very excited to say uh, that this year's showing was the strongest yet. You guys continue to elevate uh, the bar, elevate the state of the art. And it is such a, a fun part of this job to see the progress. So kudos to all of you. I want to thank our sponsors, LADWP and SoCal Gas, as always, for their continued support of this program and our continued growth together. We have a great program for you today. Uh, we have some great speakers, including our Chief Sustainability Officer, Lauren Faber-O'Connor, Maria Vargas from DOE, uh, Councilman Kevin DeLeon, as well as a fireside chat on women in the workforce and coming back from covid uh, with Cheng Wei Sun from the Women's Research Institute and some fantastic projects um, and some other announcements that I will now uh, begin transitioning to. But first, a little bit of context from someone who I think uh, most of you will recognize and has really emerged as a leading voice, not just on, on climate, but a lot of the big issues that we are, are facing as people. With that, uh, take it away, Bill. In a typical year, the world emits over 51 billion tons of greenhouse gases. And as we keep doing that, the consequences for human life will be catastrophic. When I first fell in love with computers as a teenager, they were enormous, expensive, and only the government and big companies could afford them. But my friends and I became obsessed with a wild idea. What could we do if there was a computer on every desk? And now the wild idea is quite tame. Billions of people not only have computers on their desks, but even in their pockets. Now the world needs another breakthrough. In fact, it needs many breakthroughs. We need to get from 51 billion tons to zero while still meeting the planet's basic needs. That means we need to transform the way we do almost everything. Our commitment to developing these innovations will mean the difference between a future where everyone can live a healthy, productive life and one where we're constantly dealing with the human and financial crises at a historic scale. Entrepreneurs and investors have to build new businesses and change existing businesses to get these solutions deployed. Government leaders have to enact new policies that drive the market for clean energy. And advocates have to keep their voices loud to hold all of us accountable for rapid progress. Avoiding a climate disaster will be one of the greatest challenges humans have ever taken on. Greater than landing on the moon, greater than eradicating smallpox, even greater than putting a computer on every desk. But my basic optimism about climate change comes from my belief in innovation. It's our power to invent that makes me hopeful. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> um, I also am obsessed with a crazy idea, and it, it bit me about 15 years ago when I was introduced to the idea that energy savings could be mined to finance the decarbonization of our existing buildings. I can't get it out of my head. And so as we sit here looking at these overlapping crises in front of us, a human health crisis, a social equity crisis, an economic crisis, and a climate crisis, we need to keep in mind that we're trying to achieve more than just climate action. We're trying to achieve action that's lifting people out of poverty. These are the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. You see, climate is one of them. But if we can develop cross-cutting solutions and buildings represent an opportunity to do that, we can get at this and we can thread that needle and achieve those sustainable development goals, put ourselves on track to achieve them by 2030, start to see the benefits and hit that 
hit that sweet spot, that bullseye by 2050 and stay in that green zone, stay in that safe operating zone within the planetary boundaries where we're thriving in an equilibrium. We have this opportunity in front of us to do that. It's not going to be easy. And I love this quote, adversity does not build character, it reveals it. And that's absolutely true of all of our finalists here today. You have demonstrated that in the most difficult circumstances, you can keep your eye focused on the horizon, keep going on your sustainability efforts, find new ways to save energy and adapt to a new reality while also stepping up your efforts to protect your occupant's health and enhance it and to also make an even bigger and more focused impact in the community and looking internally and thinking hard about your hiring practices and how you can create a more equitable set of opportunities. You are all examples of how you can do this and how adversity is revealing the leadership that resides in all of you. And so these are the innovation awards. Uh, Bill also talked about this notion. And a lot of times we think of it in terms of technology, right? But this is also about people. Innovation is a human concept. Obviously, we invent the technology, but we're talking about innovation and process in the way that we partner, in the way that we develop projects, in the way that we think about what's possible, in the way that we engage with community, and the way that we think about or the tyranny of the or versus the power of the and. So this is a, a curve, any of us that studied uh, economics or maybe went to business school, you've seen this or marketing. We are in that 2.5% of innovators and trying to bridge and bring in more early adopters and then bring along that early majority, the late majority. That's, that's where we are right now. And getting over that valley of death is going to take that concerted effort, that collaboration and sharing between all of us. And being here today is evidence that that's happening here in LA, thanks to you. We're gonna look for examples and that's what today is about. That's why we're here. We need examples to bring the rest of the market along to show what's possible in the areas of energy performance, water performance, industry leadership, both on the public sector and the private sector side. Affordable housing is a crisis before COVID hit. We're in certainly not a better place now. We need to lead by example and what's possible in that area and celebrate our local businesses that are making an outsized contribution, our hometown heroes that are those anchors of the community, especially in tough times. So we'll see amazing examples today across all of these categories of the kind of leadership that we're gonna need to get where we're trying to go. We updated the criteria this year, um, a lot of the same, but thought it was very important to reflect what's happening in the world and in society. And so not just focused on hard quantitative factors, factors excuse me, around savings, that's important, but also looking at measures to enhance the protection of occupant health because uh, delivering more outside air or filtering the air uh, at higher levels can fight your energy consumption uh, your reduction goals. How can you balance that? I have some great examples where uh, that power of the and is, is just really shining through. And qualitative factors are also super important. This is about innovation and leadership. So not just innovation and technology and execution, but also measures taken to address real issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion, the S in ESG, this bigger definition of sustainability that uh, more of us, more and more are, are embracing. And that's such a positive, uh, a positive development we wanna highlight here. A special thank you to our judges, um, a lot of you have been doing this for multiple years. I appreciate the continued uh, investment of time and it's your expertise and your perspective that makes this meaningful, that makes this meaningful. This isn't a, um, a, an in-house game. This is all of you deciding to collectively what makes these projects innovative and most worthy of recognition. I um, also want to thank our collaborating organizations. Not all of you were able to judge, but all of you have been a tremendous help in promoting this event and mainstreaming these ideas because that's where we are. Uh, sustainability is not a standalone. It's not a silo. It should be and is, with many of the companies uh, featured here today, woven throughout every single thing that we do. 
So with that, I would like to hand things over to my friend and colleague, uh, Lauren Faber O'Connor, Chief Sustainability Officer with City of Los Angeles. Um, I am so glad to, to be here. Thank you, Dave, for inviting me. As always, I look forward to today. But I just, I am so inspired even just by the way you started uh, this, this special event today, Dave, because um, this is just such a special day for Los Angeles. It is just, I'm, I'm blown away to hear what you said about the record participation we've had this year and in the challenge and the exciting results coming out of it. It just is incredible to see everyone's commitment to action if if more than anything a, a reinforcement of our resolve and i say today that this, you know part of why today is such a, a big deal um it's a i, I kind of want to like take a step back to appreciate a day like this which is being able to celebrate and recognize the innovators and leaders of you all today of building owners of building managers of visionaries of what is possible and what we must do but it's also today an achievement of policy and planning from the city's standpoint. I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about um, a big event that I just came from with the mayor and with the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm. So Maria, it's so wonderful to have you here and just be reinforcing so many opportunities and record of partnership between Los Angeles and the federal government and DOE in particular. It's an achievement in partnership partnership between BBC and everyone involved here, a partnership between a group of amazing advisors to the city over the last three and a half years to put together the most comprehensive, innovative, groundbreaking study of, of transitioning a, an entire grid, the Los Angeles grid, to 100% renewable energy. And before I say anything more about that, I am going to, Dave, ask you to queue up the video and we'll go from there. From the people to the power grid, LA is a city like no other. The city has set a bold goal to power LA with 100% renewable energy by 2045. That's why the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the nation's largest municipal utility, partnered with NREL, the nation's leading renewable research lab on LA 100. It's the most comprehensive, detailed study to model an entirely renewable-based grid as complex as LA's. And it's only possible with the uniquely integrated capabilities of a national lab. Energy analysts are running millions of simulations to inform objective answers to the big questions on the road to 100%. How might demand for electricity change as more Angelinos adopt energy technologies like electric vehicles and rooftop solar? What could LA's future grid look like? Does reaching 100% mean big changes locally, like building new transmission lines or power plants? How can we make sure that our new system is reliable under extreme circumstances such as fires and heat waves? What about impacts on jobs or air quality, the local economy, environmental justice, and what might all of this cost? Along the way, LADWP's engineers are learning how to use NREL's high-tech tools and data sets for their own analysis to convert the findings into working, achievable plans best suited for LA. A city that already generates over half of its electricity from renewable and zero carbon resources. Whether it's from the solar panels that rest on the rooftops of our iconic skylines, homes in every corner of the city, and our hottest neighborhoods, and in the communities that feel the impacts of this climate crisis most directly. To our plans to build the nation's largest solar and battery project in the country. To our sprawling wind farms to the latest innovations in renewable technology, such as pumped hydro storage solutions and green hydrogen sources that will help redefine how renewable energy is generated and stored. We look at what these technologies mean for each Angelino, for when they need to charge their car, lower their energy bills, or make their small businesses more sustainable. But LA100 isn't just about running models and crunching numbers. Every step of the way, research has been guided by real people who live and work in LA, making sure the study represents those who know our city best. From neighborhood and business representatives to clean energy and policy experts. The result, objective insights, 
driven by data and tailored to our unique and diverse communities. So the city can be sure a 100% renewable future will benefit 100% of LA. And so that other cities can follow our lead and apply what we've learned in tackling their own energy goals. To learn more about LA100, visit nrel.gov. Great, it worked. Um, you know, the mayor, the mayor called today and in, in releasing this, this LA100 study from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, taking something from dreamland to reality. And so it sounds like he and Bill Gates have a lot in common, uh, which is not surprising to me. And, and it really is sort of the end of one chapter and the beginning of another. Uh, it's the end of a three plus years amount of work and partnership between the federal government and local government and stakeholders and clean energy experts and environmental justice communities over the last three and a half years. And now it's the, where do we go from here? How do we put this roadmap into place? So what I also loved and the importance of starting a, a study, like embarking on a study like this is you don't, you can't predict the results. And you know, just what does it say? Overall, it says that a 100% renewable grid is entirely achievable and it can be a reliable, affordable, resilient grid that restores equity and maintains, as I said, reliability and affordability. It's an, and, and that there are multiple pathways for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power to get there. So this is a real, you know, applied, actionable study that puts us on our fast track, really keeps us on our fast track to 100% renewable energy. But also, and important to this audience, is it took into account, so you all are hopefully familiar with the LA's Green New Deal, which is the mayor's um, you know, landmark sustainability plan that, that we released in 2019. It was an update and a building off of our 2015 plan, but really took it to another level of recognizing the urgency and the, um, the emergency that, that climate change is and the economic opportunity and equity imperative. It really took all of those things together to the next level in LA's Green New Deal. And it kind of bases itself in five, the five zeros, we call them. A zero carbon grid, zero carbon buildings, zero carbon transportation, zero waste, and zero wasted water. And what the study did is, you know, this was about the grid. This was about having a completely carbon-free renewable grid. But it also taught us a lot and gave us a lot of insight about buildings and about transportation because it included in the analysis assumptions around our goals for building decarbonization and transportation decarbonization, the, some of those other really important five, zero, five zeros when it comes to our overall greenhouse gas emissions profile in the city. What it reinforced for us was the importance, the critical nature of energy efficiency and the extraordinary value that electrifying others, other parts of the economy, buildings and transportation, the value it brings to the overall system. It brings down system costs. It vastly increases the health benefits to society by combining all of these things together. And even when you factor in that significant amount of load, it's still very achievable and it's affordable, which is an incredible insight. We have to go super deep on energy efficiency. It, part of the study even showed and it tested, it went through 100 million simulations. So that's the power of a national lab. It even showed, it reinforced that without energy efficiency and without sort of smart and flexible load, it's more expensive. And so the value of putting these all together is reinforced. And it was, you saw the benefits accruing in greatest amount in disadvantaged communities. So now the task is putting, putting the, the pieces together. Uh, it didn't say, you know, you need this program or that program that we can, you know, co-design and we are co-designing. And I'm looking forward to continuing to work with you. I'm looking forward to taking in the lessons learned that you all continue to gain the insights you gain through the real world applications, the real world work that you're doing in your own, in your own fora, your own buildings, your own communities, so that we can build 
this 100% renewable energy grid and this 100% clean economy of Los Angeles together. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. I'm so excited to dig into this study. I know it's been a ton of work in the making and I wish I could uh, say that we planned it this way, but it's an awesome coincidence that it's coming out uh, on this day. So thank you so much. And I'd now like to introduce our friend and colleague, uh, Maria Vargas back from the US Department of Energy. Uh, Maria leads the National Better Buildings Challenge Initiative. And uh, she's here to talk to us today about an exciting joint initiative that we are going to be kicking off here uh, soon. Welcome, Maria. Well, thanks, Lauren, and thanks, Dave. I am sorry not to be able to join you in person in more ways than one. Uh, I was glad to be there in 2019, but I'm thrilled to join you virtually. Um, I am very mindful that I stand between you and uh, learning this year's winners, but I really think it's important to say thanks to you, for, to all of you, for the work that you do. And I also want to make sure that I am a reminder that the work you're doing is not only helping Los Angeles, but really the rest of the country. I just have a couple things to share with you. I thought I'd give you an update from the Department of Energy on our focus areas and how we're embarking on those. Uh, talk a little bit about how the work you're doing fits in. And then, as Dave alluded to, um, talk a little bit about something we're very excited uh, that LA is going to help lead the way on. So, um, as many of you know, climate change is front and center in the work that we do. Um, and understanding the urgency, the president's clean energy plan has laid out a framework to address the climate crisis and really put America on an irreversible path to achieve a carbon-free electricity sector by 2035 and a 100% clean energy economy with net zero emissions no later than 2050. A big, a big ambitious goal, but we can do it. And at DOE and at the office where I work, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, we're not only mindful of the imperative of climate change, but also the need to address these issues in a way that prioritizes diversity and inclusion, environmental justice, uh, and equity as we work together to reach our collective energy, climate, and economic goals. We know we have a lot of work to do, and we know that we can't do it alone. Cities have long been the natural leaders, indeed the critical engines in the fight against climate change and the places where we can provide the avenue for leveraging other sectors of the economy. More to the point, cities can really set and do set the tone for greenhouse gas reduction targets and through their leadership by example, community-wide targets. That's why I'm so excited to be here today all the work that you are doing matches just those ambitions uh, through the LA Better Buildings Challenge. LA was one of the first partners in the Better Buildings Challenge in 2011, uh, and you continue to lead the way. Um, you are not only working within the city to try and figure out how to address your own buildings, but so importantly, working across the community. Um, and that really, the work you're doing in Los Angeles continues to serve as a model for others. It's really important for you to know that we value the work you're doing in LA, not only in California, but across the country. And really this event today is a testament to how you've leveraged your commitment to demonstrate leadership by bringing together some of the most influential and relevant stakeholders for supporting progress that LA is making under the LA BBC and seeing the slides that Dave shared earlier was just a who's who of who we know are really uh, part of the leadership cadre in this country. So thank you again for all the work you're doing. And just as a reminder, a really important part of what we try and do at DOE working with partners like you is to make sure that not only we're profiling what leaders are doing, but so importantly that you're sharing the work uh, that you're doing with others. So not everyone has to start at square one when it comes to driving greater efficiency and increasingly a focus on decarbonization. Through Better Buildings nationally, we've saved tens of billions of dollars on energy bills and shared thousands of solutions. Many of LA's are part of the Better Building Solutions Center. And so if you haven't availed yourself of that, we really encourage you to do that. Um, we're thrilled that LA continues to push forward and engage uh, with new programs and here's uh, the exciting news that we are thrilled to make sure that you all know. Um, and I think there are 
are a number of folks that are going to be working with us on this. Uh, we are doing it right now at DOE as part of Better Buildings, a low carbon pilot. Because um, we're excited not only about where we've been, but where we really want to go and what we're going to do together next. Let me give you a little context for the pilot we're doing. As many of you know, and as many of you have, um, lots of organizations, about 70 or 80% of those that we work with in Better Buildings and the Better Buildings Challenge have set enterprise-wide, corporate-wide, greenhouse gas, carbon, or renewable energy goals. But as we work with our partners and really try to understand the path forward, when we ask how it was that they were going to get there and what that meant for individual buildings, lots of our partners said, I don't know. So we've decided to work with those that want to work with us to, and so three months ago, we launched a pilot effort to demonstrate different pathways for achieving operational carbon reductions that get to low and no carbon in both buildings, anything from multifamily hospitals, hotels to industrial plants. And we are excited to work with um, organizations who have stepped forward to work with us. We're asking partners to share one or two buildings and sort of um, dovetailing on something Lauren said, we're really trying to use this pilot to show where aspiration meets the real world. We're really trying to be very focused and mindful about how to share what will be very different pathways for very different kinds of buildings and parts of the country. And so we are thrilled that once again, LA is an inaugural partner in this effort. And what sets you apart um, for anybody we're working with that's on this pilot is really the triple commitment that LA is bringing to the table. Uh, LA DWP, LA Unified School District and the whole of LA BBC are working together to advance the ambitious climate goals for uh, you as, a, um, as the nation's second largest city. So we're excited. You just saw about LA 100. We're thrilled that DWP is partnering with NREL on LA 100 to deliver actionable data needed to modernize the energy infrastructure and achieve 100% renewable energy by 2045. We are thrilled to work continue continue to work with the LA Unified School District to lead the way in creating a clean and sustainable future for students with its commitment to 100% renewable energy and electricity by 2030. 2030. And LA BBC, Dave, under your incredible leadership, it really is a model that local governments to look to um, for supporting and scaling uh, outcomes across sectors. And we are going to be talking a lot more about this pilot at the Better Building Summit. Uh, I want to make sure that's <clears throat> on everyone's calendars. It's May 17th to the 20th. It's virtual, unfortunately. Um, hopefully next year we'll be in person. Um, but really, I encourage you to hear not only more about the low carbon pilot and what partners are doing, but all sorts of different strategies and different barriers that organizations are working with us to face um, innovate around. I really like what Bill said about innovation really being key to all of this um, and share with you what they're doing. And it is, of course, free to attend and we encourage all of you to come. Last year, Christos uh, at uh, USD and Lauren were standout speakers at last year's summit and I expect the same level of speakers this year. I am excited to learn about uh, this year's winners and to continue to work with all of you in the months ahead. These are very exciting times. Our challenge is huge, but our ambition is bigger. And I know together we can make this work. So on behalf of the Department of Energy, thank you, LA and LA BBC for all the work that you do, for helping to lead the way, continue to lead the way, and congratulations to this year's winners. Thanks, Dave. Great. Thank you, Maria. It's a pleasure to have you back. And we are thrilled to double down on our triple partnership together and really take it to the next level because you're, you're right. This is the decade of action. It's time. So we're very excited to have your support and uh, look forward to next steps with that. So now uh, to get into the program, thank you. I would like to uh, begin to transition to the awards ceremony, what we all came here for today. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Alec Dyshenko, Director of Outreach and Engagement with LABBC. A lot of you have been interacting with him over the last few months leading up to today. And Cassie Rouser, she's a multiple times over judge of LABBC, a polymath expert in so many areas, and she leads UCLA's Sustainable Grand Challenges and she'll be providing uh, the judge's perspective along with uh, Alec through the rest of the awards portion of the program. So with that, 
uh, hand it over to Alec and Cassie. Hey guys. Hey Dave. Great. Thank you very much. And, and thank you to Warren and Maria and Cassie uh, to you for, for joining and supporting us. Um, for those of you that I have that I have not connected with, I'm Alec Dyshenko, Director of Outreach and Engagement with LABBC. And I'd really like to just preface again um, by acknowledging and celebrating all of you, all of our applicants and finalists as part of this year's awards. Uh, I think we can all agree that this was an incredibly, incredibly challenging year, which makes the work you do all the more impressive. Um, the progress that was made, not just in energy efficiency and water efficiency, but also within occupant health and safety, uh, community support that we saw, as well as your internal policies surrounding um, diversity, equity, um, and even inclusion is, is laudable. And we really do tip our, our hats to you. You continue to raise the bar um, in the face of incredibly difficult times. So as Dave and, and others mentioned, um, thank you for all that you do. Um, so that said, let's, let's get into it. We have six award categories uh, this year. And let's go ahead and kick things off with the Energy Performance Award. Um, so as a backdrop here, uh, and to provide some, some context, uh, it's estimated that if an average office building in Los Angeles blindly followed the ASHRAE COVID guidelines and protocols, without the support of many of you on the phone, building engineers, as well as building management systems and technology, energy spend would be roughly 70% higher. Uh, so that provides us with some context as to how COVID has further challenged not only our mission in decarbonizing our built environment, but also the, the reality. Um, so said differently, um, you know, the unprecedented health and safety concerns and a critical need um, for not just increased outdoor air, but also higher uh, rated filtration uh, we're often at odds, as, as Dave had alluded to earlier, in optimizing HVAC loads and also um, building energy performance as a whole. So uh, that said, our finalists not only instituted comprehensive health and safety practices, but they did so um, while concurrently reducing their energy and water use through strategic re retrofit projects, um, as well as this utilization that I referred to prior of analytics, uh, software, and building management systems. So with that said, let's go on to the finalists. All right, first up we have Sunset Media Center, uh, which is owned by Kilroy, who I, I'm sure we're all familiar with. Um, this project has achieved an energy reduction in 2020 alone by 9%. Um, additionally, energy reduction since ownership has been 13%. Um, in regards to the, the specifics um, surrounding this, this project, um, Kilroy performed a number of improvements. Um, firstly, they performed a thermal imaging survey um, that was able to identify numerous duct leakage um, throughout the HVAC system. As such, uh, they went ahead and they sealed all the leaks, reducing the amount of not just lost air, um, but also keeping the temperature uniform throughout the building. Um, in addition, they also installed a data analytics software uh, with the purpose of monitoring the building's HVAC system for both inefficiency um, and then also delivering pinpointed causes, effects, and solutions to remedy. Um, we also like to contextualize this with what the owner is doing in the grand scheme of things, right? What are their general ESG policies? What have they done related to, um, to health and occupant safety in light of COVID? Um, so for each of these, we'll, we'll be going through those. In the case of Kilroy, um, they had a huge achievement in 2020 in that they achieved carbon neutral operations for all of their directly managed assets. Um, so hats off to them on that. They also completed a, cl a climate risk analysis on all their uh, assets, which is no small feat. 
Um, in addition, they earn recognition for their focus on social elements as well um, and join the Bluebird Gender Equality Index. Um, lastly, regarding health and safety, uh, when COVID hit, they collaborated with Underwriters Laboratory, uh, which provided a comprehensive pandemic response verification and on-site testing platform that they then um, use information in, in remedying certain situations. So um, that said, that's a lot of information. Uh, Cassie, I want to I want to get your thoughts and kind of your highlights and interpretation of, of this particular project. What did you think? Yeah, it's always really fun to um, review these projects every year. And Kilroy, as as all of you know, is a leader in this space. And so what's really impressive with, with what they're doing generally, of course, is that they have reached carbon neutrality in all of their directly managed properties, as you mentioned. Um, and I was also super impressed with their very well-rounded approach to sustainability generally. And they really are considering you know, the three E's, environment, equity, and economics. So always very impressive um, submissions from Kilroy. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, next up, we have City National Plaza, which is owned by Commonwealth Partners. So since ownership, they have um, achieved an energy reduction of 38%, very impressive number. And then their energy reduction in 2020 through these projects we'll discuss was 19%. Um, both very material numbers and impressive. Um, so related to specific projects they did in 2020, there were really two major capital projects. Uh, the first included an extensive LED, LED uh, lighting retrofit, inclusive of approximately 2,200 LEDs and installation of an advanced lighting control system. Uh, the second was a multi-year floor isolation project um, which allows essentially the hours of HVAC service to be modified on a floor by floor basis. You can imagine with COVID and the impacts from that, that this proved incredibly auspicious. So combined, these projects will provide uh, an annual energy savings of roughly 1.5 uh, million uh, kilowatt hours, which is a, a very, very uh, material number for all of you that know kilowatt hours. Um, in regards to uh, general ESG, health and safety, as well as diversity, um, equity, and inclusion, uh, the company has set long-term greenhouse, greenhouse gas emission reduction targets of 50% per square foot by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2050. Um, in addition, uh, they boast a portfolio, just as a general comment, boast 100% uh, of their portfolio is lead platinum and gold certified. Um, they received first place in the GRAS assessment in 2020, and they continue to receive awards through Energy Star and USGBC. Um, now, regarding health and safety, they did implement a host of, of operational changes. Um, they optimized outdoor air intake through the HVAC system. They installed um, MER-15 air filters, which are, are very high rating. Uh, they scheduled reoccurring indoor air quality um, audits, and they also implemented enhanced cleaning measures um, throughout the last 12 months. Um, so that said, Kathy, again, I, I want to get your, your interpretation from a judge's perspective on, on this one. Yeah, as you mentioned, with all of the things that, that these folks had to do in response to the pandemic with regard to, to the air quality inside, um, the fact that they were able to still reduce their energy reduction by this amount, and of course their overall energy reduction since ownership is, is super impressive at just over 38%. Um, additionally, I, I really liked how they took advantage of, of the situation of having less tenants in the building um, during the last year and, and did the floor isolation project for the customized HVAC control because they're gonna see just really huge payoffs on that when folks return. Great, Th thank you, Cassie. Um, so last up, we have 801 Tower owned by Bearings. Uh, they have realized an energy reduction since uh, ownership of 24%, per, excuse me. And then they have also achieved an energy reduction in 2020 of 9%. 
Um, related to specific projects in 2020, they did begin utilizing a, a Genia on-demand tenant program cloud-based control system to optimize HVAC use. And you're probably going to hear this time and time again because uh, it is a reoccurring thing, theme, especially with COVID. But um, technology and the ability to modify settings on one's building management system proved imperative and integral in the face of COVID um, for, for essentially all of our finalists this year. So the general comment, I just want to say that technology – has really led the way in large part in reducing um, energy and water for, for a lot of these buildings. Um, so in addition to that, they also underwent significant preventative maintenance on all of their building systems, and they installed DAV unit temperature sensors, sensors throughout the building. Um, in terms of their general ESG efforts, uh, the building has earned multiple Energy Star Awards, um, as they did in 2020. Uh, they did achieve legal certification, and they also achieved LA's Building Owners and Managers Association Award. Um, this building has also been adding green lease riders, which is interesting, uh, to tenant leases since 2014, which has ensured um, the sustainable operation of both tenant as well as common building areas. Regarding health and safety, the team performed extensive safety and cleanliness measures to manage the impact of COVID, including ongo ongoing preventative maintenance uh, for air handling units, installation of high rating uh, air filters, installation of hand-free faucets, toilets, uh, urinals, as well as soap dispensers, and the installation of nanoseptic uh, self-cleaning button covers and sealing exhaust fans within elevator cabs. Uh, so a, a lot of information there. Uh, Cassie, take it away. What, what did you get out of this one? Yeah, I was very impressed with their response to COVID um, and their installation of those air filters, and especially with their engagement with their tenants. And, and I bring that up because I really like to see engagement in, in any of these projects and a great plan and explanation of, of how they're doing that. Because you know what that really means is that the technological solutions and changes are gonna have a sustainable um, you know, life and, and, and result in even greater savings over time. So I think engagement is super important and they really demonstrated that they've done well in that space. Absolutely. Thank you, Kathy. So to recap, um, our three finalists for the Energy Performance Award were Kilroy, uh, Commonwealth Partners, and Bearings. So, Kathy, I will give you the honor. The winner, and the winner is City National Plaza of the Commonwealth Partners. And so today we have John Smith, the Director of Engineering and Operations, at Commonwealth Partners here to accept the award. Thanks, Dave, Alec, and Cassie. My name is John Smith, and I'm the Director of Engineering and Operations for Commonwealth Partners. Commonwealth is honored to receive the Energy Performance Award, recognizing our efforts at City National Plaza. These efforts included completion of 100, floor, 100 floors of DDC controls to the HVAC zone and completion of an LED lighting retrofit in both tenant and back of house spaces. As many of you know, an award like this is not achieved as a result of a single person, but as the result of the work efforts of the entire team. Due to our ESG goals, the projects we implemented demonstrates our ongoing commitment to energy optimization, resulting in 38% 30 reduction since taking ownership in 2013 and exceeding our 20% energy reduction target by 2020. No matter your motivation, as real estate owners and operators, we all want to increase efficiencies. What really ties our efforts at Commonwealth together is the commitment we have to making meaningful improvements from all levels of our organization, including our capital partner, CalPERS. Together, we identify opportunities, design solutions, and implement them to improve our environmental and financial performance. Once again, thank you. Great, 
Thank you. Thank you, John, and congratulations again to City National Plaza and Commonwealth Partners on receiving the Energy Performance Award. Next up, we have our Water Performance Award. Um, the water performance category really looks at who utilize water, not just most efficiently, but also creatively in optimizing overall building performance and occupant health. As with all categories this year, we also weighted safety measures instituted and also broader ESG efforts. So first up, we have 801 Towers owned by Bearings. Don't worry, you're, you're not having a deja vu. They were a finalist in both energy uh, and water this year. So water reduction since ownership for bearings uh, is a high 66%, very impressive. And then water reduction in 2020 uh, is 20, roughly 27%. Um, so I think the, the big takeaway with, with this one is a, a very unique and powerful technology that they're, they're using. Um, and that is a thermal energy storage system, which is saving water and optimizing energy use by way of an underground tank um, that holds over 700,000 cryogel ice balls that charge. They freeze each night during off-peak hours, and then they discharge and melt during the day, providing chilled water for cooling. Um, it's a really cool technology and saves substantial amounts of, of not only energy, but, but water. Um, and then just a little tidbit about their portfolio-wide ESG efforts. Um, they are a signatory to the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. They are a member of GREZ. And in addition, they did donate to 34 organizations as a result of COVID, including relief funds for PPE, temporary housing, and then also food banks. Um, so with that case, Cassie, sorry, what, what did you take away for this one? I'm just going to reiterate what you said, I think, and that's that, of course, they have a really impressive water use reduction since ownership. Um, and that the way that they achieved this and, and, and achieved this in the last year is, is through not only switching out fixtures, which they've done all of that, um, but through the innovative thermal energy storage system which contributes to achieving both those savings in water and in energy. So it's such a win-win and why we see the 801 tower in both of these categories. Excellent, thank you, Cassie. Next up, we have the reserve owned by Invesco. Um, they have achieved a water reduction since ownership of 22% and then a water reduction in 2020 of 10%. Um, so this was a former US post office facility um, that they uh, went through a sustainable reuse on. So it's now a 400,000 square foot creative office campus, really cool space and an exemplary model of this sustainable reuse process and, and output. So after acquiring the property in 2015, um, Invesco continued to make operational upgrades. And then they most recently in this last year completed a substantial chiller retrofit, replacing um, a chiller compressor and also installing additional controls to improve system efficiency um, between both the chiller and the cooling tower. Um, in addition, they did install variable frequency drives and condenser water pumps. In regards to their portfolio wide ESG efforts, um, they did create a health and safety checklist and then publication of the fund's fifth annual sustainability report. Um, in addition to that, they are now targeting a net zero emission uh, across their portfolio uh, by 2050. So, Cassie, what were your takeaways on Invesco's project? Yeah, I love that they are repurposing the building and making these upgrades. It's really great to see that. Um, we're going to have to see that throughout LA. Um, in the years to come in order to reach our uh, energy targets. Um, and so that chiller retrofit was very impressive and a really big project to undertake in this really challenging year. Excellent, thanks, Cassie. Uh, last up, we have Brunswick Square uh, owned by Jamestown. Their water reduction since ownership, 7%, and then water reduction in 2020 is 12%. In regards to um, specific project related achievements, um, they did implement an AquaCore smart building platform, 
um, in 2020, which helped the property management team analyze uh, real-time data, um, also daily peak demand, and then the consumption data relative to their peers. And so through this data, they were able to adjust their building system schedules to reduce both energy um, use as well as water use. And so this resulted in approximately 500,000 um, in annual utility savings. So great achievement there. Uh, Portfolio-wide ESG efforts, uh, they are adamantly focused on reducing their environmental impact. The company has set uh, short, medium, and long-term ESG targets in, in an effort to achieve net zero carbon um, by 2050 and then a, re a 35% reduction in water uh, by 2050 as well. So Kathy, what did you take away from this one? Well, I'm a big fan of smart meter systems and um, anyone who's familiar with the way water has been metered historically, um, it's, they're just really critical to achieving reductions like we're seeing with the Brunswick, Brunswick Square. Um, so it sounds like these systems for them have both achieved uh, water and great water and energy savings. So love the technology. Excellent. <laughs> yep, absolutely agree. Thank you, Cassie. To recap, our finalists for the Water Performance Award were Bearings, Invesco, and Jamestown. Cassie, as always, I give you the honor. The winner is, for Water Performance, the 801 Tower by Bearings. And I believe this is a recording. Thank you very much. We're very pleased to have received this award and, and for the, your acknowledgement. It does take a village to operate a building of this size and complexity. So I have a number of people to thank uh, for uh, the award and, and being successful in, in getting it, um, receiving it. We, I'd like to start with uh, Neil Perkey, our general manager, and the individual who had the inspiration to apply for the award. His assistant, Kelly Rapasardi, uh, SVP, Nicole Audette, Bearings Consulting Engineer Richard Spina and Lord Green Sustainability Charlotte Walker. Number of people involved, um, people staff at the property level as well. As I say, it takes a village and we're appreciative of your acknowledgement. I'm uh, Sandy Troop. I'm the asset manager of this jewel box building known as 801 Tower. Very appreciative of the acknowledgement of our efforts on this in this building. Bearings isn't new to the ESG space. We have pursued pro ESG programs for over 10 years now. Um, we've committed significant resources to sustainable investment and man management practices. And we believe it really is responsive to our uh, client uh, investment objectives uh, um, in a holistic manner. During this past year and during the COVID pandemic, occupancy at 801 Tower was much lower than typical, dropping down to less than 10% at times. So we implemented an on-demand HVA system uh, delivery that only ran when tenants needed it. Uh, this helped reduce our water uh, consumption. We also focused on exterior landscaping and we, um, uh, and, and water reduction throughout our common area spaces. So collectively, those efforts uh, were successful this past year. So I want to thank, uh, thank you for acknowledging um, our collective efforts. We're pleased to have uh, received the recognition, and I will turn it back to Alec at this time. Thank you. Great. So congratulations to 801 Tower and, and Bearings, and um... Dave, I will hand it back to you. Great. Thank you, Alec and Cassie. Uh, this is a point where we're going to give everyone a quick coffee or bio break, tea, whatever your thing is. Um, the screen says 1255. We'll start again at 105. I'd like to welcome everyone back. It is 105. Um, so we're going to try to move a little bit more quickly, get everyone back to work by two o'clock. Um, we have uh, another great segment of the program to cover. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce our next set of speakers. My colleague, Christiane Schrobelgen, she's Managing Director of Marketing at, here at the LABBC. 
Um, I asked her to do this panel, not just because she's so obsessed with beautiful line spacing and slide design, but her passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion in commercial real estate is, is really infectious. And I thought uh, I would be remiss if I didn't give her a chance to lead a conversation today. Um, we're also joined by Sheng Wei Sun, um, PhD. She's a senior research associate with the Institute for Women's Research. Um, we'll be having a, a great Christian, excuse me, conversation uh, between uh, Sheng Wei and Christiane. So with that, over to you, ladies. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so uh, like Dave mentioned, I, I am obsessed with this. I am also a founding board member for the Real Estate Association of Latinx Professional as a, as a Nicaraguan American myself. And I am the vice chair of uh, USGBCLA Women in, in Green Committee. Um, and I am thrilled to welcome Sheng Wei Sun uh, from the Institute of Women's Policy Research with us today. Um, the, the Institute does a lot for policy, um, for getting policy across um, uh, federally. And so we felt like it was important for her to be included in this conversation. Can I get right into the questions? Shane Wei, thank you again. Welcome. Uh, it is a pleasure having you here. So what are, so to, to provide some context too, because we know that um, sustainability isn't sustainability without equity. So what are what are some of the statistics that our audience um, needs to keep in mind and, and as to why this conversation is important? Okay, thank you so much, Christiane, for the introduction. And again, thanks LAPBC for inviting me to the conversation. Uh, I'm excited for uh, bringing our research and share some statistics around understanding uh, gender inequity in the workforce and uh, what it means in a pre-COVID and post-COVID world. So I wanna focus on uh, gender pay gap, occupational segregation, uh, and also women in the labor force, uh, trying to understand what uh, was kind of the barriers for women. In 2019, full-time year-round women workers still earn 18% uh, less than men. Uh, and um, you know the, the, the gap is even larger for Hispanic and black women. And part of this is due to gender segregation at work. Uh, we know that women and especially women of color are overrepresented in low wage service jobs. And there are a lot of barriers for them to access middle skilled, uh, uh, decent paying jobs. And segregation at work contributes to gender and racial pay gaps and wealth building and uh, undermining workers' long-term economic secur se security. Um, and another statistic I'd like to share is that it's not true that the majority of low-wage jobs today um, are at or, uh, you know, at or below the minimum wage are held by teenagers. The majority of such work uh, is uh, held by prime age workers and especially women, and a large share of them are single mothers. Um, so you know, um, long gone are the days when women's income are only supplemental to the family income. Um, and a lot of, we have, you know, one out of two of the working families in the US with children under the age of 18 are breadwinner moms. Um, and um, right before the COVID hit uh, in 2019, uh, women actually surpassed men as the majority of the labor force uh, for only the second time in history. And the last time was during the Great Recession when men lost most of the jobs. Um, but, you know, of course, COVID changed everything. Um, and another aspect that's, you know, really important to understand women in the workforce is that, you um, the COVID exposed the really the, uh, the the lack of support that women have. So this is primarily due to um, our existing care model is inadequate and costly. So, for example, um, despite you know overwhelming evidence that high quality care, child care uh, has long-term benefits for children and also helps women's employment. Uh, we don't have enough investment in child care and care is regarded as a private responsibilities rather than a public good. And as a result, um, you know, a lot of working families can't afford care, uh, child care and other kinds of care. Uh, so this has direct consequence at, uh, for why there is why women disproportionately were hit by COVID and left uh, the labor force. So would, would you like to, uh, me to get into some statistics of what happened during the COVID? Yes, please. Okay. 
we, you know, by this time, I, I don't know if you have heard that the COVID recession is adopt uh, a she session because women have lost so much, so much more jobs than men. Um, so, you know, job losses, this is again, primarily because um, the sectors that's been per hit particularly uh, hard are the ones that the women concentrate in and they're, they're in hospitalities, uh, leisure and hospitalities, uh, health services, childcare, uh, at, at, and, and, you know, other kind of service sectors. Um, and, uh, you know, gender differences in, in the job loss reflects pre-COVID or pre-pandemic um, inequalities. But I also want to raise attention to the fact that by September last year, which is six months into uh, the recession, uh, a lot of, you know, as the jobs slowly started to recover, um, un unemployment rates were declining, but that kind of masked the reality that, that a lot of workers, especially women, are leaving the labor force. Um, and this is not only due to they cannot find, they couldn't find work, but also because of the lack of care support forcing a lot of women out of the labor force. So out of the 1.1 million workers um, who dropped out of the labor force last September, 80% uh, were women. So I think that was just, you know, really telling uh, of women were going through. And um, I think, you know, the latest statistics is that one year into the recession, women are still you know, 5.1 million jobs below the February level uh, compared with 4.4 um, mil million job, uh, sorry, few fewer jobs for men. And another uh, important thing that when we talk about these inequalities, uh, you know, and equity issues is the uh, is that it's not just a gender issue. Uh, most of the job loss were borne by women of color. Um, and uh, so race, ethnicity coupled with gender, you know, led to exceptionally high um, job loss for black and, uh, black and Hispanic women, and also for low wage workers. Some economists have been calling the pandemic job recovery as a K-shaped recovery. So for a lot of white uh, collar workers or professional workers, the you know, the, the, the job recovery has been achieved pretty early on, but uh, we are still going through, you know, a very deep recession for women in these low wage workforce. And uh, finally, I want to call attention to these shocking um, statistics. So either PR just put out a report. We looked into the gender wage gap in 2020 and compare it with last year. We found that the gender wage gap actually shrank during the 2020 but it's not for the good reason. It's because most of the jobs, uh, you know, women were disproportionately uh, concentrated in low wage jobs and they have not been recovered. Right. So they were just being left out of the equation. So again, I, you know, I threw out a lot of statistics, but uh, showing, you know, this pandemic, um, you know, is a she session. It's also the mothers who have been uh, disproportionately affected because of the lack of the care support. Okay. Um, so, you know, building a robust care infrastructure will be the key to achieving uh, a gender equitable recovery. Right. Thank you so much. I was reading the other day um, through a McKinsey report, which I, I believe we're going to share through the chat, that um, to give people a perspective, if we don't do anything about, about the situation right now, we're estimated to lose $1 trillion in global GDP. Um, but if we take a take action now approach, then we can add $13 trillion of, um, of, GD, of global GDP by 2030. And that's a, that's a pretty large difference there on what this means for the economy. So I like to say that this isn't just a woman's issue. It's not just a family issue. It's not a community issue. It's really an economic issue and why it's so important. Um, so thank you for that. So um, why, could you maybe share um, an anecdote, like a historical reference, uh, what, as what has happened before and, and, and what does happen if we don't act now? Right, I think a lot of it um, uh, has already, you know, it, it's just, you know, been covered when we talk about what was happened before the pandemic. So the pandemic is not something that just suddenly happened. It exacerbates existing inequalities and everything that I covered, um, you know, occupational segregation and gender pay gap. And also the, the gender pattern of job recovery is also highly similar to uh, the Great Recession of 27, uh, the, the 
2007 to, to 2009. So we, we knew that the, the Great Recession was the, like a man session because it, it was mostly the sector that men was concentrating in that was hit the hardest. But uh, men also experienced a much sooner recovery than women. And over the past 10 years, um, we still see you know, disparities in job recovery and um, unemployment rates by gender and race. So I, get, I think it's just reiterating a lot of these inequalities, uh, the, the, the chasm that we see during the COVID recession is really a reflection of what, what was happening and because we didn't have all these um, supports in the place. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, I, I wanna give you guys something to take away and, and to be able to um, take into your, to your offices and into your jobs. So we wanna make sure that we're mentioning, um, first of all, uh, uh, try to figure out a way within your community and within uh, within your organizations to stop the exodus to begin with. Um, see what kind of support you can provide. Also, uh, make sure to review uh, and to commit to the women's empowerment principles um, created by the by UN Women. Um, United Nations, as Dave mentioned earlier today, has a sustainable development goals. Uh, so number five is gender equity, and then a look into the 2021. Bloomberg Gender Equity Index. I know some of our partners are already committed in doing that as well. So we weren't able to cover um, everything today. It's a, it's a pretty deep conversation. I encourage you guys to join us tomorrow. We have the USGBC Women in Green Committee um, conversation about achieving an equal future post COVID. Um, we'll be sharing the link for that. And I hope you guys join us for that as well. Dave, thanks so much for giving us the space to talk about this. Uh, Shane Wei, thank you again. Thank you. Great. Thank you both. And this is just the tip of the iceberg on a, on a huge conversation. And so I'm glad we were able to um, at least surface that today, this notion of, of thinking about this as, as a she session. And <clears throat> I also wanted to point out, in addition to being a sustainable development goal, I was showing some the top 20 solutions according to Project Drawdown. The number one climate solution, period, across the board, is educating women and girls in developing economies. Number one, because as soon as as soon as people begin to have more choice in life, they're more empowered. Um, we we start to see different outcomes, and so all of this is interconnected. Um, this is not a separate issue from climate, and it's not a separate issue from real estate. So, thank you both. Thank you. Great. Um, so with that, uh, we will shift back to our awards program. I'd like to welcome back Alec and Cassie to take us through uh, the rest of the program, starting with industry leadership. Uh, this is a big one, private sector. Um, getting our cameras back on and back to you guys. Thanks, Dave. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So next up, we have the industry leadership private award. So um, this category really looked at Los Angeles uh, commercial real estate portfolio owners that essentially went above and beyond and demonstrated an outsized contribution, not just environmentally, but in respect to community support, social equity, diversity, and inclusion. So it was, a, it was very holistic um, in scope here. So first up, we have Brookfield Properties. Um, their portfolio-wide energy and water reduction since ownership was 34% and 49%, respectively. Great numbers. Um, and in 2020, they completed a variety of efficiency projects um, across their LA portfolio. It included the implementation of a Siemens demand flow program. Um, it included a water harvesting project. Uh, installation of variable frequency drives for its primary chiller. And then they also completed LED lighting retrofits and installation of Lutron lighting systems and cooling tower upgrades, a mouthful. They did a lot in 2020, very impressive. Um, in regards to health and safety, uh, they did mandate indoor air quality testing frequently. They installed high rating air filters um, as well as humidity sensors. Um, and then one, one cool thing that kind of stood out here was they instituted a program by which their employees 
uh, can donate to a nonprofit of their choice and receive a match from the company. Something that's very applicable and, and relevant during during these times of, of volatility. So that said, Cassie, what were your what were your takeaways on this one? Well, with Brookfield Properties, of course, they're always uh, an impressive portfolio um, with incredible savings in both energy and water, uh, as you pointed out, um, especially since ownership. Um, I guess with this one this year, I was just really impressed with the response to the pandemic. Um, and I loved seeing that uh, in, in employee uh, matched donation program. So they're, they're really approaching this from a, a very well-rounded um, place. That's right. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Um, next up, we have equity residentials. So their portfolio-wide energy and water reduction was 7.2% and 6% respectively since ownership. Um, in regards to their 2020 projects, they completed 11, 11 different solar PV projects representing about 2.3 million uh, watts of capacity. Uh, they did complete installation of multiple heat pumps and solar thermal systems. And they also completed approximately 100 in-unit renovations inclusive of smart, sustainable technologies. So again, um, very, very impressive projects uh, company-wide um, in, in 2020. And then in regards to their general ESG efforts, they completed a year-long initiative to create a new ESG governance structure and steering committee to provide further accountability um, as well as uh, new board level oversight for ESG management. Um, in, in addition, 2020 marked the year that EQR met their 25% reduction of GHGs, uh, great milestone. And then they also implemented, like other players, a robust COVID tracking uh, program for residents and staff. And lastly, they hired a diversity and inclusion director, which uh, Shang Wei and Christiane, you know, that, that's very applicable to the conversation. So that's great to see. Uh, Cassie, I will turn it over to you. What were your thoughts on this one? Well, these are newer buildings, as I understood. So, you know, they're already quite efficient. So any gains that they're making uh, are very impressive. Also, these are residential units. And so, as we know, over the last year, most people were working from home or home much more than they're used to being at home. And so, again, to achieve these types of savings when you have occupants is, is quite impressive. Um, their COVID response was impressive, and of course, I also very much loved seeing that they hired a diversity inclusion director this past year. I mean, that's an important first step to real commitment in that space. Yeah, and Cassie, that's a great point on, on residential and, and multifamily um, impacts. Because they were pretty much fully occupied on like office, retail, hospitality, and, and others, it was very, very challenging to see those energy and water reductions. So kudos to EQR for that. All right, next up we have Hudson Pacific Properties. So their portfolio-wide energy and water reduction since ownership was 20% and 18% respectively. Uh, their 2020 projects were inclusive of a number of LED retrofit uh, projects, a new construction project which implemented a cool technology known as building integrated vol voltaics, um, and then achievement of fitwell certifications for multiple assets. Um, in addition, they, they did something that was pretty neat and that they rolled out a digital application known as My HPP Office that communicated safety, logistics, and health uh, information to tenants in real time, which proved um, incredibly uh, important throughout the last 14, 14 months of COVID. Um, in terms of their general ESG efforts, uh, 2020 marked the year that Hudson achieved 100% carbon neutrality across all operations. Um, an incredible feat, uh, kudos to them for that. And then at an organizational level, uh, Hudson amplified their ESG efforts. They expanded their diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, and they created an intensive training program for all levels of employees. Um, one more cool thing is they did provide a grant of $650,000 um, to fast-track critical assistance to LA artists impacted by COVID. Uh, so really, really um, awesome work there. So, Kathy, what, what did you take away from this one? 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure I have much more to add than what you said, but just so well-rounded um, in their approach and, and impressive results this last year. As I mentioned before, I really love the engagement efforts with their tenants and they took a technological approach with that real-time communication, super cool. Um, also impressed, of course, that they achieved their carbon neutrality in 2020. Um, the expansion of their, their diversity, equity, inclusion efforts and training of all employees, it just really demonstrates a commitment and a, and, and a financial commitment to, to what this means to them moving forward. Awesome. Thanks, Cassie. And lastly, we have LBA Realty. So the portfolio-wide energy and water reduction since ownership here was 37.6% and 31% respectively. Again, tremendous, tremendous um, numbers. Um, in 2020, they updated their energy management system and implemented an advanced controls, um, a set of advanced controls to optimize HVAC performance on a number of their assets. They also partnered with Yardi to roll, that, roll out a smart building program, providing real-time monitoring, fault detection, and diagnostic. Um, in terms of their general ESG efforts, the company did form a community outreach um, group. Uh, which identified and supported 18 charitable organizations, which is incredible. Uh, contributions included over 270,000 meals to the LA Food Bank to battle food insecurity in the community throughout COVID. Um, so again, really great work, um, God's work in a lot of ways, what all these groups are, are doing. Um, but Cassie, before we announce the, the winner, what were your, your takeaways on this one? Well, this, this portfolio has achieved such great savings in both energy and water since ownership. Um, it, it's, it's really impressive. And um, they also increased their energy star score from an already high 92 to 97, um, which of course is really hard to do when it's already so high. So that's quite impressive. Um, and that community outreach program um, and, and their commitment to food security in the region this year was critical as we all know. Yeah. Great. So to recap, uh, we had four finalists for this one. We had Brookfield, we had Equity Residential, Hudson Pacific, and LBA. Take it away, Kathy. Right. And the winner is Hudson Pacific Properties. And we have with us today, Ryan Tinnis, the Senior Director of Engineering and Environmental Sustainability from Hudson Pacific Properties to accept the award. Congratulations, Ryan. Thank you so much, uh, Alec and Cassie. This is, this is fantastic. And on behalf of Hudson Pacific, uh, we'd like to thank uh, the LEBBC for recognizing us for this honor. Uh, you know, during a very challenging year, our team remained focused on leadership and sustainability. In 2020, we launched our Better Blueprint Corporate Responsibility Platform and achieved 100% carbon neutrality and operations for all of our properties and tenant spaces. Despite a global pandemic, our teams were able to execute on our 2020 capital plan in full, including the completion of energy efficiency projects, the advancements of our DEI efforts, rolling out of our tenant communications app and portfolio achievement of the Fitwell viral response module, uh, as well as the recognition from the EPA as an Energy Star Partner of the Year. Uh, we'd like to thank the many Hudson Pacific employees and partners who've helped us accomplish these achievements. And again, thank you so much to the LABBC for your continued partnership. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan, and congratulations to Hudson Pacific on this award. Now we're going to move on to industry leadership public. So, you know, in general, one of the most important, if not the most important remedy to the climate crisis we are in is education and awareness of the facts and how we contribute and can be part of the solution. Uh, so the Industry Leadership Public Award centers around uh, public, primarily academic institutions that provided an outsized contribution to the environment, society, and to the community um, and students that they serve. Now on to the finalists. All right, so first up we have Cal State Northridge. So they experienced portfolio-wide energy and water reduction since ownership of 19% and 18% respectively. Um, and in 2020, uh, they completed a extensive LED, LED lighting retrofit in a matter of 10 months, uh, 
which is kind of insane in and of itself. So the project will result in a targeted annual energy savings of 8 million kilowatt hours, uh, equivalent to $1.5 million in annual savings, which they plan to then reinvest to accomplish even larger, more complex projects in an effort to reduce their energy um, use. Um, they have also set ambitious long-term goals to reduce uh, their scopes one, two, and three greenhouse gas emissions, so 50% by 2035, 100% by 20, and 100% by 2050 as part of their climate action plan. Uh, that said, Cassie, what did you take away from this one? Well, coming from a public university uh, myself, I know how tough it is to achieve such savings like this when your population is constantly growing. <laughs> so it's quite impressive. You know, I'm really happy to see, you know, they have a clear climate action plan with clear targets. Um, and I'm impressed they took advantage of the, their probably mostly empty campus this past year and did that LED upgrade despite, um, as we know, really dire budget numbers for public institutions because upgrades like this can be pretty spendy upfront, but, but you know, they're gonna see the savings in years to come. So it was good, good foresight on their part. Great, thank you, Kathy. Uh, next up, we have Los Angeles Unified School District. Uh, they achieved a portfolio-wide energy and water reduction since ownership of 15% and 21%, respectively. Um, so the big accomplishment uh, for LAUSD um, over 2020 was, was really this policy goal of achieving 100% clean renewable energy for its entire portfolio for electricity use by 2030. Um, in addition to that, they've also invested approximately $45 million in energy, water, education, and also pilot programs over the last five years. Um, and they have approved uh, continuation of the program by investing another $90 million over the next uh, five years. Uh, the last thing with this one um, that I found pretty neat was they created what they called the Empowered Program. Uh, which was a program to train students in environmental skills and stewardship. And again, it, it goes back to, you know, education and awareness are so critical to our mission and, and, and what we're doing. And so it's awesome that they instituted that program um, in 2020. Uh, Cassie, what, what were your takeaways here? Yeah, uh, incredibly impressed with their commitment. I mean, we know this, this, School district is huge, and for them to to commit to renewable energy by 2030 and zero carbon by 2040, is is really ambitious and and just really impressive, and and as we know, you know one way they're going to get there is through their commitment also to this course integration, where where the you know the students are going to understand these commitments and these values, and you know this is going to be a really sustainable um, effort. Absolutely. Well said. Next up, we have Los Angeles Community College District. Um, so portfolio-wide energy and water reduction since ownership here was 10% and then 44% respectively. Um, as a general note, LACCD is the single largest community college district in the United States. Um, and five of their colleges lay in designated disadvantaged communities with I believe the highest levels of vulnerability to, to climate change. So um, just, just for context and color there. Um, so recently LACCD uh, in 2020, they doubled down on their sustainability and their clean energy commitments. They conduct their first carbon emissions inventory and they passed what they're calling their clean energy and sustainability resolution. Uh, they did that in July of, of last year, and it really establishes the most aggressive and comprehensive sustainability goals in the entire California community college system. Um, and it's 100% renewable electricity by 2030 and then 100% carbon free uh, goal by 2040. Uh, so very impressive there. In regards to um, education, uh, they did establish opportunities for remote engagement with staff, uh, faculty, and students, including a speaker series in the fall, and then also biweekly newsletters and a climate crisis training for staff um, and students. So again, awesome um, goals, policies, as well as education there. Cassie, did you have a thought on that one? 
Yeah, and no, just again, like LA Unified, it's just so impressive that the Community College District is also committing to these renewable energy and carbon neutrality goals. Um, you, just to put it into perspective, when we launched our UCLA Sustainable LA Grand Challenge program back in 2013, we had a 100% renewable energy goal by 2050, and that seemed kind of crazy and ambitious. And, and look how everyone has stepped up since then and, and been far more ambitious. It's just really fantastic to see. Absolutely. Thank you, Cassie. So to recap, um, our three finalists for the Industry Leadership Public Award were Cal State Northridge, LAUSD, and LACCD. Cassie, take it. All right, and the winner is the LA Community College District. And today we have Dr. Ruben Smith, the Vice Chancellor, uh, Chief Facilities Executive of the LA Community College District to receive the award. Thank you, Cassie and Alec, and uh, it's good to be here. First, I wanna thank the Los Angeles Community College District Board of Trustees for taking a bold step to make these commitments. I also wanna recognize all the hard work performed by the LACCD staff that influenced this in-depth resolution and who are deeply engaged in the implementation of our strategic strategies for success. We're honored to receive this award. We appreciate the recognition of our decarbonization and renewable energy goals and acknowledging all of the other sustainable commitments we've made as a community partner and resource, resource stewardship. Uh, as I serve as the Vice Chancellor and Chief Facility Executive, I hope um, that we can be successful really soon in the near future. I'll be overseeing the efforts necessary to achieve the major milestones outlined in our resolution. And as Dave stated earlier, this is a decade of action. At LACCD and our nine colleges, we're taking an all hands approach to clean energy and sustainable sustainability commitments. We hope to be back here next in the next uh, uh, in the near future uh, to share of our future successes. And thank you again for this recognition and congratulations to all the other award recipients. Thank you, Dr. Ruben Smith, and congratulations again to LACCD. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Smith, and, and thank you, Alec and Cassie, for guiding us through uh, those awards. Um, you know, education really resonates with me as a, a father of, of two small kids, and, and I think we all know uh, they teach us, right, and they mirror us, and so um, fantastic to see the engagement here. Um, I now uh, want to switch to introducing uh, another friend and colleague, um, Kevin DeLeon. I first met him when he was in the state Senate, and he was holding a hearing on ways to finance energy efficiency projects statewide, and, and uh, had the, the pleasure to, to testify before him and his committee. I can say that he is uh, true blue. He is uh, walking the talk, and um, he is extremely knowledgeable and committed. And I was so happy when I heard that he was running for council and even happier uh, when I heard that he won because this guy is, is, is here to make stuff happen. So with that, um, I wanna go ahead and play some recorded remarks. I really appreciate him taking his time uh, out and making time to engage with, with us here today, so. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very honored to be part of the seventh annual Innovation Awards. I'm just coming back from a hike and wanted to make sure that I had an opportunity to share a few words with each and every one of you. Now, given that it's award season and given that we're in Los Angeles, I don't mind sharing that I was asked to present at the Golden Globes, the Grammys, the Oscars, and yes, the Los Angeles Better Buildings Challenge. And let me just say this, I only accepted one invitation. Now, how could I say no to LABDC? Now, I think you all know my passion for sustainability and innovation. Even along my hikes, I'm Zooming with folks. I don't really recommend that, but I'm very proud to have authored one of California's strongest uh, pieces of environmental legislation in SB 100, California's 100% Clean Energy Act. Of course, it took an amazing coalition of organizations to get this done. But frankly, we didn't have a choice. We don't have one. This is our only path forward to a cleaner and greener world. Now, while this law sets the goal of powering all of California, our grid, 100% clean, carbon-free electricity by 2045, and guess what? I think we'll get there way earlier than that. The work to get that goal is ongoing, and it's happening by the very people here present at this award celebration. That's each and every one of you. So the people on the front lines of sustainable building development are, in effect, our modern day 
pioneers. These are the people and the teams will make our cities healthier and by virtue of their work, improve the quality of life for everyone. So we can breathe clean air into our lungs, every single child, regardless of who they are and where they come from. Now I wanna commend the LABBC and Executive Director David Hodgins for recognizing the achievements and contributions of the nominees, but even more generally, the industry as a whole. And I also wanna recognize the broadening of the award categories, including this year's Affordable Multifamily Performance and the Hometown Hero Awards. You're proving that sustainability isn't just for the multi-billion dollar or the billion dollar projects, it's about all of our projects as we move into the future. Now, as you know, I'm working on a plan of my own, a way home to develop 25,000 new homeless housing units all by the year 2025. We can do this together. And I'm also working to expand affordable housing for low and moderate income households in Los Angeles. We have to do this together because when we have a very strong Bull Heights, guess what? We have a very strong Brentwood. We have to do this together because we lean on each other. And like you, I believe we cannot ignore the most vulnerable among all of us. There's no longer room for denial of climate change. It's happening as we gather today. And we cannot deny the most obvious consequences that those impacted by climate change and carbon dioxide equivalent, not SOX, which is going to matter, 2.5, ozone, are among the most vulnerable in our communities, not just in Los Angeles, but worldwide. That's why it's even more important to work aggressively and ensure that all projects incorporate sustainable solutions as a centerpiece. Now, I congratulate all of you for your hard work because your hard work and innovation make it possible to expound the boundaries of what is possible. To all of the nominees of LABBC, the award winners, congratulations, felicidades, and thank you for your dedication and ingenuity. Thank you and have a great afternoon. And I can tell you this, I know I look a little, you know, scrubby right now coming back from my, that hike. It's the only way I can survive during this COVID pandemic right now while I'm Zooming with folks every single hour of the day. But seriously, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank each and every one of you, the good folks at LABBC for all that you do to all our awardees, to the nominees today. Felicidades, very well deserved. When we come together, we have such a better LA, a better California and a better country. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. He is a, a tough one to follow, and uh, we are lucky to have him in a leadership position here in Los Angeles. Like I said, uh, this this man is very knowledgeable, um, very committed, and, and he feels this in his bones. And I thought it would be appropriate um, to have him uh, speaking before our final two categories today, because as he said, uh, we got to lean on each other. Affordable housing and small businesses are the engine, the backbone, whatever metaphor you want to choose for our economy. Um, we are all connected. And so with that, I'd like to welcome back Alec and Cassie to present the final two awards today uh, before I do a little conclusion and call to action. Hey, guys. Great. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, Kevin. All right. So a little, little context here on the Affordable Multifamily Building Performance Award. Um, in the state of California, there are only 24 affordable rental homes currently available for every 100 low-income renter households. That is a huge disparity. And so COVID has only deepened uh, that crisis and those numbers and continues to disproportionately impact low-income communities where utility costs were already a burden before the safer at home order. So as a result, um, we did not receive as many entries this year for this award category um, as expected with the emergency order, but we do have a phenomenal project uh, to share and celebrate with you today. And that is Miramar Tower owned by Jonathan Rose Companies. And I think the big takeaway on this one is it was one of the first residential high rises to electrify its central hot water system. So a tremendous achievement um, there. In addition, they did uh, provide extensive envelope improvements, including air sealing and dual pane windows. And they did also install a 72 kilowatt 
uh, rooftop solar PV system to ensure electrification uh, without overstraining the grid. Uh, so, Cassie, t talk to me about this one and, and your thoughts before we provide them with an award. I you know, just want to echo what Kevin said and what you said, and, and that's that, you know, any effort in affordable multifamily housing needs to be celebrated. Um, you know, their commitment to 100% green power by 2021 is very impressive. And that's not only in LA, but across their national portfolio. So very uh, in, in, impressive work that Miramar Tower is doing. So we have Lawrence Zulo, Director of Environmental Impact at the Jonathan Rose Companies to accept the award today. Hi, thanks Cassie and Alec. I'm Lauren Zulo, Director of Environmental Impact at Jonathan Rose Companies, and I'm honored to accept this award, um, recognizing our team's work at Miramar Tower. I wanna to extend the biggest thanks to the whole team who made it happen. Um, our executive team who set deep and ambitious goals for the climate impact of our portfolio, our energy consultants on this project, um, Bright Power, our architects, Brooks and Scarpa, our asset management team, the acquisitions rehab team, our lenders and tax credit investors who worked through the complications of incorporating the ambitious energy scope and incentives into this tax credit transaction. Our property management team and especially our residents who were so resilient and dynamic in response to the challenges of construction during COVID. Um, and importantly, the teams at the Low Income Weatherization Program, LADWP and SoCal Gas, who provided much needed incentives um, to catalyze this work. We're thrilled to have Miramar Towers recognized today because we think it showcases the ability to bring decarbonization and energy efficiency to everyone in California, including affordable housing. We really appreciate the efforts of the LABDC and um, all of you on the phone today for the very impressive work and for bringing us all together uh, to celebrate. So thanks again and back to you, Alec and Cassie. Great, thank you so much, Lauren, and congratulations again to you as well as the larger Jonathan Rose uh, Companies team. All right, so last but not least, we have our Hometown Hero Award. Uh, this one is really for small and medium businesses uh, that made an outsized contribution to the sustainability movement. You know, just as a general stat, I believe the number is 15,000 businesses have closed due to COVID. Uh, much of which are small and medium businesses. And, you know, that said, they are the lifeblood of the local economy and they represent a significant portion of the total energy use in LA. So we need them. Um, and so we, we found it critical to include this category as part of this year's awards. So first up, we have Avanti Homeowners Association. Um, the energy reduction since ownership here is approximately 16%. Uh, they acquired this asset, it's a series of seven buildings in 2018. Um, and it was incredibly outdated, had old building systems, had fluorescent lighting, if, if anyone remembers what those are. Um, so it resulted in substantial operating expenses. And so what they did was they went in and they made substantial upgrades. So they installed an extensive LED retrofit or LED, they completed an LED retrofit project. They installed um, custom occupancy sensors and lighting controls. And they also implemented a cool, what they called it, a cool automation software um, into the HVAC control system. So in total, the project is providing a cost savings of approximately 52% and a 17% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the previous year. Cassie, what, what were your takeaways on this one? Well, living within an HOA myself, I know how impressive these upgrades are. Um, they clearly had the vision to see how their upfront investments would pay off, especially with that huge reduction in their energy costs. You know, this is a really great model for HOAs across the region. I mean, in fact, I'm gonna bring this example to my HOA board. Love it, thank you, Cassie. Next up, we have Vallarta Supermarkets. 
uh, portfolio-wide energy and water reduction since ownership here is 18% and 15% respectively. Um, I, I think we can all agree, stepping back to 2020, was an incredibly stressful year for all of us, but especially for grocery stores. Uh, you know, it felt like Armageddon at, if you were at a grocery store during the early days of COVID. Um, but despite those challenges, Viarta really pushed forward with an even more aggressive sustainability uh, set of goals and targets, and they achieved a 21% reduction in water use and 33% drop in waste going to landfill fills while achieving the what what is called the grocery stewardship certification, uh, which is incredibly impressive. Um, Viarta, they also implemented a pretty sophisticated energy management system, uh, demand control ventilation, and also CO2 monitoring throughout all of their, uh, sorry, throughout a majority of their Los Angeles stores. Um, and another neat thing here is they are set and determined to eliminate all R22 refrigerants from their systems. And as we all know, refrigerants are big contrib contributors to ozone depletion. Um, so if we are to uh, find a solution and get through this time together, um, we do need that piece and we do need to eliminate those older refrigerants in our system. Um, in addition, they've made aggressive commitments to exceed Title 24 energy savings, um, as well as water reduction benchmarks. And on new stores, they are exceeding Title 24 by 15% or more, uh, which is very hard to do. So, uh, Cassie, any, anything here? Yeah, just re you know, reiterating what you said, these supermarkets have been our lifeline to the world this past year. And really, despite all of the challenges that these businesses faced, Viarta maintained its commitment to sustainability through its operations in water, in energy, and in waste. So all I can say is bravo, uh, and thank you so much for your essential service. Great. So to recap, the finalists for the Hometown Hero Award category are Avanti and Viarta Supermarkets. Who's our winner, Kathy? Our winner this year is Viarta Supermarkets. And we have Steve Netherton here with us, the CIO and Vice President of Continuous Improvement at Viarta Markets, to accept the award. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, what, um, what great results across all the categories. It's, it's been a pleasure listening to everybody's efforts uh, uh, before, uh, before uh, uh, this award. So, but thank you, Alec and, and, and Cassie. Um, the Viarta team is honored, um, sincerely honored to uh, be recognized for our achievements in reduction of energy, water usage, and, and our carbon footprint. Um, Viarta Supermarkets began uh, implementing strategic initiatives um, focused on energy and, and water and, and carbon back in 2017. These initiatives have yielded significant reduction across the board of all those key metrics. Um, just to, again, uh, share a few uh, since our baseline uh, back in 2017, over an 18% reduction in uh, electricity usage, 7% uh, reduction in water, 15% reduction in natural gas, and we've been able to uh, remove 40% uh, of our waste from landfills, um, which we're, we're very excited about. On the near horizon, we're implementing new technology all the time and innovations, uh, inclusive of our, one of our newest stores, which is uh, being built in Van Nuys, which we are really um, focused on uh, achieving uh, the LA uh, city carbon neutrality goals. Um, this store is, is designed with leading edge, te leading edge technology, including energy management systems, CO2, sensing and, and mitigation systems, lighting controls, demand control systems, HVAC dehumidification systems, and so on. We actually expect to be able to, or project to reduce uh, our baseline or uh, usage in this store by 27% uh, with all these different technologies being implemented. So again, a lot of great work done, a lot of great work to do. And um, thank you so much for the recognition. And uh, we, we certainly and sincerely appreciate the award. Uh, back to you, Alec and Cassie. Great, thank you, Steve. Congratulations and congratulations to the larger Viarta team. Uh, so that said, Cassie, thank you for, for joining us today. I appreciate the support. And with that said, thank you all. And Dave, back to you.
Congratulations, everybody. Um, such a tremendous showing this year. And I know the judges had a heck of a time. And as always, it was down to the wire. I think it came down to the, the final scoring sheet. So congratulations all around. Um, we are not quite done yet. I am going to say some thank yous and I have uh, a, a few more things to say. Congratulations to our winners. As I said, all of our finalists, again, all of you are such critical proof points in what's possible here. It's all different ways to get to one single destination, which is decarbonization. Um, thank you again to our sponsors, LADWP and SoCal Gas, as always, for your continued support. We couldn't do this without the support of our collaborating partners and, and the judges. And it's your, again, it's your perspective, it's your organization's involvement that makes these awards meaningful that makes these awards unique and different really from any other awards in the city or throughout the country for that matter. So I'm really proud of the partnership here, uh, most of all. And I'm proud of my team. Thank you all. This is always a, a ton of work, um, you know, six months leading up to a, a one hour or two hour event. And all of you are just like family to me and I, I can't thank you enough. Um, uh, just especially uh, call out to uh, the LABBC team for all your support. So what now? You know, we're doing pretty great. These are amazing projects, right? There's a lot of work to do. Um, make no mistake. Here we are today in 2021. Um, we are developing and executing plans. And we heard about some phenomenal work that's already underway. And so what we're trying to do with LABBC is to roll that up and help tell a story what's happening in Los Angeles and where can we jump in and throw some bodies at projects, thought partner with you guys to move things further, faster, deeper. So our goal is a thousand buildings and 150 million square feet. That represents roughly the top 25% of performers um, and uh, the, the tip of the market that's going to move us, bust through that portion of the innovation curve I was showing earlier and start to get that early majority and eventually that late majority and the laggards. So you guys are the tip of the spear and we're sharpening that tip right now. Um, and I'm very excited about uh, the work that's happening together, getting to 2025. And when we are successful, that will equate to over 240 metric tons, 240,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent avoided and generating data that's going to drive that market, turn that flywheel, because we don't stop there. We got to keep going through that first uh, needle. We got a thread I showed earlier to keep on track towards those sustainable development goals. That includes building more affordable housing, preserving the affordable housing that we do have. And that's a huge focus for us and excited to continue that work um, with our partners. That's another through line here. So all of this is happening simultaneously while decarbonizing the power grid as the LA 100 uh, study is going to uh, elaborate for us what those, what those ways forward are, getting towards net zero by 2050. Now, everybody is aiming towards net zero by 2050. In LA, this is a science-based target. A lot of work has gone into this. Um, by folks to pull this all, all onto the same page. So this is not going to be easy, um, but hopefully we can all read the sign. It's time. Uh, they, we have the technology, we have the expertise, we have the capital. There's no more excuses. We can do this, but no company, no sector, no country, no city can do it alone. Um, it's going to take radical collaboration. And that's why I'm so excited about this new partnership uh, that Maria alluded to earlier and that Lauren alluded to earlier. We're calling it the Low Carbon Leaders uh, Pilot under the LA 100 banner where we're working uh, to coordinate resources from LADWP and SoCal Gas, incentives, technical assistance from NREL and DOE to leverage the expertise from labs and uh, the different offices within the department to access technology demonstration opportunities. I'll be sitting on the down select committee for the GSA's Green Proving Ground, which is a technology vetting platform for the federal government, bringing those ideas, bringing that knowledge, that R&D from the federal level down here so that we can benefit from it at the local level and put it into practice. Um, they will also provide remote technical assistance 
to augment uh, what we're providing here with the boots on the ground and the city involved to provide that feedback loop um, that's so important to inform smart policy, a smart policy that will help uh, bring up the bottom. All of you on the line today are the leaders, but we can't get there with just your efforts. We have to bring everybody along with us or we won't get where we're trying to go. So I'm very excited about this partnership. Um, applications are open. We announced this in our February webinar. For those of you uh, that saw, uh, we opened the applications March 1st. They're open until uh, a week from today. And a lot of the folks that are involved in today's program have already submitted interest forms. I'm super excited to see that. Hope we'll see even more um, by next week. We will select the participants in April ahead of a May full launch, as Maria mentioned, at the Better Building Summit, which is a national uh, virtual event, uh, which will be in May. And between now and then, um, starting to uh, mobilize resources to support these projects. And so I, I wanna bring us to a conclusion here. Um, we've talked a lot about iconic landscapes, um, opportunities here in LA, and they say, think global, act local. And in LA, that really means something. Uh, LA is a global brand. What we do here matters globally. People are watching. So all of this work is not happening in a vacuum. And, and uh, to state the obvious, uh, we are all uh, sitting on the same planet. What may be a little less obvious is just how thin this little band of atmosphere is wrapped around the planet. We exist in a very fragile, very special balance with nature and with climate and with the planet. We're fortunate. We've lived in this stable environment for over 10,000 years since the last ice age where temperatures haven't varied plus or minus two degrees. We're pushing it. We're pushing it. The planet's ability uh, to, to continue to absorb that because in fact, it's only as thin as the skin of an apple, the atmosphere, this whole area that we uh, run around and, and make meaning and live our lives within. And so uh, we have entered the age of the Anthropocene. For those of you who don't know that term, that means uh, people are in charge. We are changing the planet. Uh, we are seeing lightning storms at the North Pole. That happened yesterday, never happened before. So the future is literally in our hands. And uh, to quote one of my favorite philosophers, Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Thank you all for your leadership. I look forward to continuing our, on this journey together. Thank you, everybody.